Just after 11.30am on the 12th of December 2022, the low hum of chatter in Court 12 abruptly stopped as Jonathan Dowdall finally came face to face with the man he had agreed to betray. Settling himself in the spot usually reserved for the foreman of a jury, the 44-year-old's hands visibly shook as he took a sip from a glass of water. Across the courtroom, through the bank of black-gowned barristers and suited solicitors, sat Jerry Hutch. There was no flicker of recognition or emotion on Hutch's face as Dowdall took a seat. He just stared at him impassively, giving absolutely nothing away. But it's safe to assume that a lot was going through his head. After all these years that it could come to this, the mouthy son of one of his wife's closest friends, about to give evidence against him at the special criminal court trial for the murder of David Byrne. If found guilty of the notorious shooting at the Regency Hotel in February 2016, there was little doubt but he'd be sent down for a very long time. And Dowdall, unable to meet the gaze of the man better known as the monk, what must he have been thinking as he waited for the court's business to begin? Clearly he felt this was his only shot at having some kind of a normal life in the years to come. But at what cost? And how exactly did this former Dublin city councillor, once tipped to become a prominent political leader, a father of four and owner of a successful electrical business, find himself giving evidence against one of Ireland's best known gangland figures? This is the story of Jerry the Monk Hutch from his early days as a young hoodlum through to his astonishing acquittal in the Special Criminal Court. How did this quiet-spoken man from the North Inner City become one of the most notorious figures in Irish criminal history? How did he end up on trial for murder? And why did he walk free? It's a story about blood bonds, bitter feuds and shocking betrayal. It's a story about the changing face of Dublin and about the pursuit of justice in the courts and on the streets. The Monk is a four-part crime world long read produced by Ian Mullaney and read by me, Nicola Talent. Part one, The Double Cross. Those familiar with this underworld of crime have found it hard to tell whether Dowdall was being smart, having deduced that this was his only way out, or intensely naive, bordering on stupid. His eight days in the witness box lurched from the occasionally thrilling to the more often mundane. But if there was one solid fact we learned, it was that Dowdall is one of those guys who just doesn't know when to shut up. Between his rambling answers to the prosecution's questions in the courtroom or the hours of grainy Garda tapes surreptitiously recorded during a car journey to Northern Ireland with Jerry Hutch in March 2016, Dowdall certainly proved his own admission of being a champion crap talker. And those infamous tapes, such a coup for the Gardaí, but also such an insight into the psyche of Jerry Hutch, a man who had always been so careful to never give too much away. They revealed him to be a guarded and circumspect person, even when in the company of someone supposedly on his side and loyal. It looks like he was right. It was also clear that Dowdall wanted to impress him, With a barrage of compliments and confidences, the tapes showed a deep-seated immaturity, which was alluded to in the prosecution's closing statement, where he was compared to the bratty cartoon character Bart Simpson. There must have been so many times in that courtroom when Jerry Hutch found himself wondering where exactly his fortunes had taken such a bizarre turn, that some minor player, the type of man he generally tried to avoid, was now posing a very serious threat to his freedom. 
The entire affair is one of the most extraordinary episodes in Irish criminal history, one that began on the streets of Dublin's north inner city and came to a head in the town of Fuengarola on Spain's Costa del Sol, when Jerry Hutch was finally tracked down in August 2021 after being on the run and extradited back to Ireland. It involves audacious bank robberies and multi-million euro drug deals glittering political careers and the rise of the Kinnahan cartel. There's torture and con men, hit men dressed in drag and as elite guardy. Not to mention a bizarre and badly misjudged appearance on Joe Duffy's Liveline radio show. It covers the most ferocious gangland war to ever erupt here, when close to 20 people were murdered in a run of tit-for-tat killings that threatened to paralyse Dublin City. It brought Gangland Ireland into the mainstream media, where once only the loyal readership of the Sunday world might have been aware of the main players in this murky world. Now everyone knew who the Kinnahan and the Hutch families were. There was no more ignoring or avoiding this dark underworld of drug crime, revenge and murder. TV shows like Love Hate might have enthralled fans for five seasons, but the real thing was and still is happening on the streets around us. And it's a lot more frightening and brutal than we could ever have imagined. Let's start with Jonathan Dowdall, the man willing to hand up the monk in an effort to get himself and his family on the state's witness protection programme. Sitting in the special criminal court last December, he looked very different to the by now familiar photograph taken for his election posters in 2014 when he stood for Sinn Féin in Dublin's north inner city. Back then, he was lightly tanned and boyishly handsome with sandy brown hair. But the man led into the courtroom by six Gardaí and prison officers had visibly aged in a relatively short space of time. The stress of the last few years clearly taking its toll. Sunday World News editor Niall Donald and myself were there to see his first appearance in the witness box. He's looking very shook. He does, and certainly I'm not in a position to judge, but his hair is significantly greyer than when he was last pictured. He looked stressed. Nobody could blame him for that. I'm sure it's very stressful, but he he carried it on his face. He looked sort of grey, I thought, his pallor. Now, he got a little bit better as he got going, I would say, maybe a little bit more confident, but his voice is very quiet. It's quite difficult to hear him. Um, And... Yeah, he looks like it's the last place in the world he wants to be. Yeah, um, like he keeps he keeps his eyes down. He's almost directly facing uh, Jerry Hutch now. There's a load of barristers in between, but they're 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 kind of face on, really. Things could have turned out so differently for Jonathan Dowdall. Born and raised in North Strand on Dublin's north side, his family are of solid working class stock. His mother had her own trading stall in the city centre and the family are still well known in the area. His connection to Jerry Hutch goes back to when he was a younger teenager. Jerry's brother Patrick, or Patsy as he's better known, was a neighbour of the Dowdalls and three of his children worked on Jonathan's mother's stall. During the trial, Dowdall explained how his family would occasionally get loans from the Hutch family. And when he graduated from the Dublin Institute of Technology and set up his own electrical business, it was the Hutches he went to for financial help if he ever had issues with covering bills or his payroll. The company, Abco Electrical, did well and by 2014 he was employing 12 electricians and had contracts with the HSE, Dublin Airport Authority and the National Museum in Collins Barracks. A lot of the work involved installing security and alarm systems. Successful and married with four children, he moved his family to a decent-sized house on the Navan Road in Dublin's north side, which he kitted out with top-of-the-range CCTV system and an electronic security gate. Rather famously, he also had a huge fish tank, which was rumoured at one point to have had a false bottom where it was suspected he had various kinds of guns and rifles. As well as exotic fish, Dowdall also loved cars and very big motorbikes. He was often seen driving either of his Snow White BMW or powerful high-end bikes around his Dublin 7 neighbourhood. 
His introduction to politics came when his company did some work at the home of a prominent Sinn Féin member. With the successful business that gave employment to young fellas in the area as apprentices and his family's good standing locally, he must have seemed like a good fit for the party. In 2014, he stood for Sinn Féin in the local elections and that May he came fourth out of the 19 candidates who were running for a seat on Dublin City Council. Although it would seem his addition to the Sinn Féin ticket was not universally popular with the party membership, possibly because it probably cost fellow Shinner and well-established local activist Gay Fagan a seat, which might explain some of the hostility Dowdall claims to have encountered, although others have said he simply wasn't up to the job. One council colleague of Dowdall's described him to the Irish Times newspaper as a bobblehead, someone who constantly nodded along but rarely said anything. There wasn't a whole pile to him, they said. He came out of nowhere in the 2014 local election and he disappeared just as quickly. And the council records have shown that while he sat on several committees, including the Central Area Joint Policing Committee and the North Inner City Drugs and Alcohol Task Force, his involvement was pretty limited. Motions he put forward included one for the Gardaí to tackle antisocial behaviour in the centre shop on Mount Joy Street and another one for the council to provide Wi-Fi in North Dublin senior citizens' facilities. Perhaps most controversially, he pushed for the heavily opposed string of Garth Brooks concerts to be allowed go-ahead in Croke Park. But despite Sinn Féin's initial high hopes, his political career never really did get off the ground. By late September, less than four months after winning his seat, it was announced by the party that he was going to quit because of health reasons. But things weren't as clear-cut as they initially seemed. The very next day, in perhaps the first public indication that Dowdall could be trouble, he spoke to the news website, thejournal.ie, telling them that he wasn't resigning from the council. Instead, he was quitting Sinn Féin. He blamed his decision on a small element in the party who'd been spreading negative rumours about him. Insisting that he still supported Sinn Féin and its policies, he claimed some members in his own area had been causing nothing but havoc spreading rumours, which had led to a very stressful situation. I think the people in the area need to know the truth he told the reporter, saying that online speculation about his decision to resign had prompted him to speak out. I have a health issue that came on through the end of the elections, he said. That isn't the main reason I was standing down. Sinn Féin itself is an absolutely super party and I strongly believe in Sinn Féin's politics. The councillors in Sinn Féin, I believe, are the best councillors out there. Mary Lou, I have the height of respect for her. But he told how family and fellow politicians had informed him that other party members were bad-mouthing him at various social events. It had been going on for some time, he said, and he'd hoped the rumours would end after the elections, but they didn't. Between the gossip, the hospital visits for his health issues, rearing a young family and running a business, he said he had to ask himself, what is the point? Maybe it was all this stress and tension that led Dowdall to make some seriously dubious and devastating decisions. Indeed, after retreating from public life, things took a very sinister turn in January 2015 when he put up an advert on Dundee to sell a BMW motorbike for 16 grand. He'd got a reply from a man called Alexander Hurley who went to view the bike and who tried on some motorcycle clothing at Dowdall's home on the 12th of January. The two men struck a deal and Hurley was given a bank account number to transfer the money into. But a short time later, he was surprised to get a phone call inviting him to dinner at the Dowdall's home. Hurley explained it all to Joe Duffy a couple of years later during an interview on Radio 1's Live Line show. The father was threatening to cut off your fingers, I think, at one stage with pliers. Um, right. And, and did, they, did they say this out loud to you? This is what we are going to do? Yes. And then um, shaving, did, did, did they actually shave your head with an electric razor? Yes, they did. Did you think you were going to die? 
Yes. They said that they enjoyed my company when I first met them and they invited me for dinner, he told Duffy. I said I would accept and after arriving at the house, that's when it all changed and turned into a nightmare. It was a trap. He wasn't joking or even slightly exaggerating about what he suffered at the hands of Dowdall and his father Patrick. And perhaps it's at this point I should explain that the only reason anything is known about what happened to Alexander Hurley that day in Dowdall's garage is because 14 months later in March 2016, Gardy raided the home as part of an investigation into a completely different event, the Regency Hotel shooting. We'll come back to that later, but what we need to know now is that during that March 2016 raid, a USB stick was found. When analysed by the Gardaí, they found a truly sickening video of Dowdall and his father Patrick torturing Alexander Hurley for the guts of, well, two hours. During their trial in 2017, footage of the video, which was filmed on a mobile phone, was shown to the court. It revealed Dowdall wearing a black balaclava and holding a tea towel to his victim's face before pouring water over his head, a practice commonly known as waterboarding. You could also hear Patrick Dowdall threatening to pull his fingers off one by one with the pliers. It emerged that when Hurley arrived at Dowdall's home that day, he was forced into a garage attached to the house where he was tied to a chair with cable ties by Patrick Dowdall. It seems the Dowdalls were convinced that Hurley was planning to con them, that he'd no interest in buying the motorbike and was only interested in getting Jonathan Dowdall's bank details so he could attempt to defraud him out of cash. In the video which the court heard was taken by a young woman also present. The two men could be heard quizzing Hurley about alleged acts of dishonesty carried out by him, but they also physically attacked him. One of the judges who heard the case described what happened in that garage as truly appalling and shocking. He said he was subjected to what could only be described as a brutal assault, punctuated with menacing threats of being maimed and killed in an effort apparently to persuade him to admit to a plan to defraud. The video showed Hurley's head being shaved and repeatedly instances of attempts to waterboard him. He was told he would be chopped up and taken to Northern Ireland, that he would be buried in the mountains that his head would be burnt at the stake and that a pliers would be used to remove the knuckles from his hands. To drive that particular point home, a pliers was taken out and waved over his hands. The Dowdalls also told Hurley they were members of the IRA and that Jonathan was a close friend of two prominent Sinn Féin politicians. How petrified Hurley must have been when the two men and another person who was present that day discussed in front of him what they were considering doing to him, which included feeding him to the dogs or chopping him up and placing him in cellophane bags and storing him in the boot of a BMW. When they finally released him, Hurley was told that if he went to the Gardaí, he and his family, including his parents, would be dead within 48 hours. As the judge noted during the trial, his distress and terror throughout the experience was clearly evident from the short video clip seen by the court. In March 2017, the Dowdalls pleaded guilty at the Special Criminal Court in Dublin to falsely imprisoning and threatening to kill their victim. And in early June 2017, they received their jail sentences. Jonathan Dowdall got 12 years in prison, while Patrick Dowdall got eight years for kidnap and assault. Less than a year later, however, after an appeal, they were resentenced, Jonathan to 10 years imprisonment with the final 25 months suspended, and his dad to seven years with the final three years suspended. It was an extraordinary episode one that proved to be a massive headache for Sinn Féin, who distanced themselves as much as possible from Dowdall. 
So Sinn Féin are shocked, appalled to hear that uh, this individual who they thought was a fine, upstanding uh, member of, of society uh, was involved in any of this. This is Fiona Sheehan. He's the Ireland editor of the Irish Independent. So Sinn Féin are saying that the first that they knew of any problems with Jonathan Dowdall was in March of 2016 when his, his criminal activity uh, was discovered. And even at that point, we, we didn't know the, the full extent of it that, that we, we do now. Uh, so their, their, their basic contention uh, is that they had, they had no knowledge uh, that there was anything at all untoward with, with Jonathan Dowdall up, up until that point. You're, you, can, you can accept that version of events or you can also say, well, there was another few warning signs uh, along the way. There are still a number of unsettling questions about this that haven't really been addressed by, by Sinn Féin. There have been attempts over the years from Sinn Féin to distance themselves from Jonathan Dowdall. They're not going, going too well. I mean, ultimately, everybody regards Jonathan Dowdall as being Mary Lou MacDonald's protégé. She was very closely associated with him, so hence... Questions about Jonathan Dowdall's relationship with Sinn Féin are being directed squarely at Mary Lou MacDonald. As disturbing as the torture episode was, there was a lot more to come involving Dowdall and his father, Patrick. So let's go back to the 10th of March 2016, when it all began to unravel for them. When Gardy raided Dowdall's comfortable semi-D on the Navan Road, where Patrick was living at the time. It was exactly a month since the Regency shootings and Dublin was in the middle of an all-out gang warfare. And it was part of that investigation into the murder of David Byrne that Gardy got a 24-hour warrant to search Dowdall's home on suspicion that he was storing firearms and explosives, neither of which was found. However, officers did seize a BMW car worth 85 grand, a high-powered motorbike, documentation, other valuables, and of course, that USB stick. There were also rumours that members of the Garda Water Unit were called in to search a huge aquarium, thought to be worth tens of thousands of euro, in the shed of the property. No arrests were made that day, but in an astonishingly ill-thought-out move, shortly afterwards, Dowdall decided to ring into RTE Radio 1's live line to talk to Joe. At five Jonathan one, Dowdall, five, one. good afternoon. How are you, Joe? Well, how are you, Jonathan? You're all over the front page of the lot of newspapers yeah. today about your house being raided. What happened? Life is upside down at the moment, Joe. It's ready to shoot. Uh, my family are in an awful state. My daughter won't go to Walker. She, she won't go to college. Um, Joe, we run a business, mm-hmm. as you know. Yeah, I've yeah. yeah, met you before. I've yeah. run a business since 2007. I've never been on a social welfare pain in my life. I've worked my whole life. My mother's a street trader. I ran in the elections. I'm sure I've no criminal convictions whatsoever for a breach of the peace year, many, many years ago. Um, I've no links, connections to criminality or any crime organisations in, in any shape or form. Oh, Joe, why do they make something so like public? Okay. They were good enough to notify the media, but they didn't tell them why they were here. They led us to believe that I was involved with the Kinahans. I've never met the Kinahans, both of them, or been in their presence, or any of those, in, in my life, job. So I'm worried to hear, like, I've walked my arse off to buy that car, number one. Hmm. I've walked my arse off since I'm 16. My mother's a street trader, stood in the cold and the rain to, 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 to give us an education. My whole life is going to be torn. Joe, that's not fair. Joe, I'm well regarded in the north inner city. Okay. I'm not involved in crime. So, I mean, he was out in force denying he had anything to do with anything. Yeah, I mean, I remember actually my, my dad, I came home, I was talking to him after work one day when I, I called in and he said, God, did you hear that guy on the radio? Poor man. You know what I mean? Isn't that terrible what's, what's gone on with him? Shame on your father, by the way. <laughs> <What>? just, <laughs> let's just put that out there. Well, you know, I mean, I suppose that's how he came across. Mm. He came across very sincere that he was... You know, and uh, you know, it's, it wouldn't be un, 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 unimaginable that he would be mixed up in this just because of an innocent association with people uh, involved. You know, related to Jerry Hutch or whatever. He made a great case that he was, you know, it was just the, the you know everybody who knew them was being targeted, and he had something. Uh, you know, he said. You know how the inner city works. Everyone knows everybody. Some of them I'm proud to know. There's plenty of others I never met, and he he made a convincing case, but. You know, as the investigation went on, mm. 
it, it, you know, it became apparent that uh, that that he wasn't an innocent person just swept up in this net. And actually, that raid led to him serving a very lengthy prison sentence, ultimately. During his lengthy chat with Joe Duffy, Dowdall claimed he was as surprised as anyone else to see Garda units pulling up outside his home, saying that he managed to open the door just in time to stop them bursting through. I wasn't cautioned or arrested at any point and I've no idea what it was in relation to, he said, about the 10 to 15 armed Garda searching his home. While he confirmed that a luxury BMW, a motorbike and documentation had been seized, he denied having any connection to criminality or any crime organisation, insisting that if there'd been anything whatsoever to link him to crime, it would have come out during the election. He brought up his roots to the north inner city, telling Joe that he knew people related to Jerry the Monk Hutch, but who also had no links to crime. You know how the inner city works, everyone knows everyone, he explained. Some of them I'm proud to know and there's plenty others I've never met. Just because someone has the name Hutch doesn't mean anything. Patrick Hutch is the father and he's been good friends of mine since I was a child. It's been in the media all along that this man has no involvement in crime. I know that man, that man is a friend of mine and this is probably linked to that. He also told he was now worried about the future of his electrical business. There are at least nine electricians with mortgages who are probably going to lose their jobs now, he said. I'm worried here. I've worked my arse off since I was about 16 and now my whole life has been turned upside down. Like any business today, my company is always in overdraft. I borrow from the credit union down the road. For weeks I'm waiting for payment to come in. It's not a cash business. And he described how only that morning his clients had been questioning his employees about the publicity following the raid on his house. I've been doing work for a particular company in the city centre and one of my staff members was greeted by a management figure who put a paper in his face and said, what's this all about? I'm going to lose the company over this. But Dowdall soon found a lot more was at stake than just his livelihood. In fact, things escalated so fast. Less than two months later, he was at Dublin airport saying goodbye to his wife and three of his children. He was about to get on a flight bound for Dubai, but he was arrested by Gardaí. And it was nothing to do with holding firearms or torturing Alexander Hurley. Instead, he was being picked up for murder. It must have been a fairly dramatic moment in Terminal 2 on the 17th of May 2016. At the beginning of this year, during the Regency Hotel murder trial, we heard how retired Garda Michael Mulligan was one of the officers involved in the investigation into David Byrne's killing. He told the court how he observed Dowdall clear security before approaching him, identified himself and then arrested him for murder with a firearm. Mulligan told how it was only Dowdall who was leaving the country at that stage, that he'd waited to arrest him until after he'd gone through security. He was there with his wife and three children. I allowed him to process himself through security, he said. I wasn't going to do it in front of his family. I approached him as he was removing items from the tray. Mulligan also recounted how when Dowdall was informed that he could be kept for questioning for up to seven days, he'd replied, I think it's a joke. It was no joke, and Dowdall was brought to Clontarf Garda Station. During his own evidence, Dowdall explained that he'd been on his way to see his sister. I wasn't coming home, he told the court. I'd set up work in Dubai and I was staying in Dubai. Now stuck in a room in a Garda station on Dublin's north side, things must have seemed very bleak to Dowdall. He was visited at various times over the next few days by his daughter, his wife and his brother-in-law. And according to former Garda Mulligan, it's around this time when Dowdall broached the subject of the possibility of entering the Witness Protection Programme. While in that room, he said, is there any way out, the former officer told the court. Mulligan said he told Dowdall that he was not having this conversation with him. But Dowdall was not put off that easily. And according to Mulligan, on the night of the 20th of May 2016, he brought it up again. As I was exiting the room, he got up and asked if he could talk to me in private, Mulligan explained. He asked if him and his family could go into the WPP. 
Mulligan said he told Dowdall that was above me and for his solicitor and the DPP. A lot has happened since those interviews in Clontarf Garda Station. Dowdall was still in jail serving his sentence for kidnapping and assault when he was charged on the 27th of April with the Regency murder. But before that sentence ended, he came forward with new information about David Byrne's killing. And just weeks before the Regency trial kicked off late last year, both Dowdall and his father Patrick pleaded guilty to facilitating the murder by making a hotel room available for the shooters the day before. Dowdall is now in jail serving another four years, while Patrick has another two years to serve. The murder charge against Dowdall was dropped and in return, he turned state witness against Jerry Hutch. He might be expecting to disappear to start a new life with his family in another country once his jail term is up. But double-crossing the monk may not have been the smartest course of action. The Monk is a four-part crime world long read produced by Ian Mullaney and read by me, Nicola Talent. Crime World is a podcast from sundayworld.com. Dot com.